my name is Angie Vishianan and I am the founder of Leg Up Legal. We provide a mentoring program that connects prospective law students to lawyers so that they can learn more about the legal profession before they dive into law school. And um, we've been doing these Zoom meetups to bring in folks that are legal professionals and um, folks that are familiar with the law school admissions and law school um, space so that they can talk to you about things that will help you in your legal career. And so I'm really excited today to introduce you Vito, and he's going to be talking to you about um, different options for pursuing a JD program for folks who think that they want to continue working and going to school at the same time. So V, I'll let you take it away. Hello, everyone. Great to have you here today on a Friday. Um, like Andrew said, uh, my name is V To. I'm the Vice President of Enrollment Services for Barbary slash ILaw. And if you are thinking about uh, a career in law, at some point you'll cross Barbary's path as we're, we're big on um, you know, bar prep and uh, kind of law school success, uh, you know, kind of content and educational resources and all that. And one of the things that, you know, Barbary and ILaw we've done is uh, partner with law schools to launch highly flexible uh, hybrid JD programs that address the non-traditional learners, those who are fully employed or want to maintain their career that, you know, you don't necessarily want to pick up and, and kind of and give up uh, your day job uh, and be committed to three years uh, full time at a campus. You have to kind of you know, work to maintain your income while going to law school. And so, you know, uh, I, and I think this is kind of a newer thing. Uh, the ABA has not, you know, approved many of these other than certain part time programs. And but now, you, with technology, with evolution and some innovation, you know, we, we're seeing more and more law schools offer uh, what we call kind of in two groups, a uh, hybrid JD program that is both called a, a variance and a non-variance. And so to, to kind of keep it simple is this, a non-variance is just your regular JD. It's a, you're, you're kind of the same as your law school JD that's available to anybody with an undergraduate degree who applies and gets admitted to just like their campus program. And uh, the variance is one where specialized in a certain area of a, a kind of a specialized JD, for example, you know, in intellectual property or something else. And they're typically limited to the seats and caps uh, by the ABA because, you know, they're allowing the curriculum to be online because there's a reason for that variance so that students can take this program while fully employed you know, in, in the instance of like UNH's program where these are employed um, people who have an, a career and interest in intellectual property. Uh, they wanna maintain their IP career, which is you know, they're typically high, highly successful professionals in IP already and wanting to get the JD. So that's the variance and non-variance. Uh, but I think for today's purposes, you can just think of it as if I need to be employed and I'm looking to become an attorney, what are my options, right? And, and really it is simply this, I, the thing I'll, I'll try to simplify, but hopefully not oversimplify is if you're looking for that path, if you live near a law school, then you can, go to the website and say, do you have a part-time program, right? And typically what that is, is if they have, most won't, but some will. And then what that means, even if they have a part-time program, uh, you're going to look at their schedule and it'll be like, okay, in the evenings, you come in three times a week or you come in Friday, Saturday, or, and it varies by different schools. So there, it's hard to pin down exactly what that schedule is, but look for a part-time program that you could drive to. Right. And so that's the first kind of, you know, kind of option for you. The second is then you go, OK, well, what if I don't want I can't drive, you know, spend three evenings a week uh, and I can only do maybe one weekend a month. Can I still get my JD? And the answer is yes, perhaps uh, you, you, you kind of have to think about what hybrid options are available. And so. By hybrid, I mean a lot of the curriculum is now online. And the ABA is at the point where they're approving about 50% of the curriculum to be online. 
So law schools are starting to, to offer, you know, hybrid JD programs where you could do the vast majority or up to 50% of it online. And the other parts of it, you do have to come into the campus for face-to-face -face residential sessions, but they structured it so that you can do it, you know, for example, one of the programs you can do uh, five visits, uh, actually four visits per year for one week at a time. So you can kind of negotiate with your employer and go, hey, I can schedule PTO or I need to be away or, you know, I can kind of take vacation and things like that and go to this law school and spend, you know, uh, four visits, uh, weekly visits per year and fulfill that uh, kind of residential requirement, but the rest of it be done completely online and you can still earn your JD. So those options are becoming more and more available now. Yeah. So something real quick though, um, I just, in order to set the foundation, because a lot of these people that are usually on these calls, um, they may not be very familiar with the law school world at all. <laughs> so I want to just make sure that everybody knows. So the reason that um, there's just not a lot of online programs right now is because the ABA, the American Bar Association, um, accredits law schools and they have certain requirements for law school curriculums. And the traditional full-time JD program requires that you do 83 credit hours to complete your JD degree. And at least 64 of those credit hours must be taught in regular classroom sessions. And then you only had about, you know, a third of those credit hours could be taught through distance learning, what they call, you know, could be online or could be various other means of learning. And so the traditional JD really didn't have a lot of flexibility um, for people to have online education. And so then, you know, yes, there's the part-time JD programs, as V said, and they pretty much have the same requirements as the full-time JD, except that they do allow you to work during um, you know, the program. And they typically will stretch out your credits to four years instead of three years. Um, but again, you know, there, there might be some daytime classes you're still required to attend, or there may be some evening programs that you may have to attend. So, um, so you know, every part-time program is a little bit different, but it basically still has the same um, in classroom instruction requirements as the traditional JD, which is why it's not well suited for people if you don't live in the location that's close to the law school or commutable or whatever. Um, and then these hybrid programs started pretty much in 2013, where um, they requested a variance from the ABA in order to um, be able to do more distance learning and have more online education requirements. So that's a little bit of the vocab <laughs> that V's describing. Um, but I think, you know, when I first got into law school, I, you know, didn't really quite understand what were the differences between traditional part-time and these new hybrid programs. So just wanted to break it down a little further. Yeah. And, you know, uh, and a little bit later here is during the Q&A session, we'd love to kind of, you know, talk a little bit about your background and happy to kind of walk you through some of my thoughts and advice and how you might want to approach, you know, thinking about law school what are the different options available to you, uh, how to apply, how to maximize, you know, scholarships and financing law school. Happy to kind of leverage my experience, you know, and talking to a lot of students similar to yourselves and thinking about the law school career. So happy to do that as well. But uh, to kind of, you know, almost transition a little bit is, yeah, so you, you find the program that, well, first of all, you got to realize, okay, how much time can I dedicate, right? This is, if you're a traditional student, then you just go the traditional route, right? Three years, you're done. But in these part-time programs, evening programs, hybrid programs, they typically do stretch to about four years. So because, you know, it is, when it's online, it is going to be stretched out a little bit more. Uh, so it's hard to finish in three. So it's typically the curriculum's about, you know, and they vary school to school, maybe three and a half, four and there's a little bit more flexibility to get it done, maybe even more than four years. Some students actually have to, because of life, take leave of absence and come back and things like that. So there's a little bit typically more flexibility, but the good news is upwards of 50% of the curriculum is now online. You could do that in the evenings, whenever you want. Most of the curriculum is what we call asynchronous, which means that within a weekly structure, 
within a semester's confines where you have to get everything done, you have the flexibility to do this online work in the evenings, weekends, during breaks, whenever you can to get it done. So you're not locked into your work day where I'm typically, you know, probably the reason why you're, you sign up for this session is because you have a full-time job or you plan to get a full-time job where you're tied up from, you know, eight to six, you know, every day. And you can only do in the, in the evenings and maybe the weekends where you have some time free. And then, like I said, in certain schools have structured it where you only have to come to campus four times a week. I mean, sorry, four times a year. So then you kind of book your flights or you drive in, you know, you kind of, and and those weeks are intensive. They're like, you know, eight hour days where you're in class for the full week. That way you fulfill that face-to-face requirement as part of the curriculum where 50% of it is not online. So that's why you have those, you know, the ABA kind of requirement. You, you do have to kind of complete that coursework in, in a residential uh, format. And then I'll mention a couple of things. So then you, you, when you apply, it, it's the same, right? These programs are identical in terms of the application process, right? What typically law schools do is they say, okay, you're applying to a residential program, our you know, evening part-time program or our hybrid JD program. And some even say it's just a hybrid uh, JD schedule. It's the same program, it's just on a different schedule. It's online, spaced out, four years. And when you come to campus for X number of hours and then you do the rest of it online. So, so, so the same uh, kind of law school application principles and advice apply here, right? Where you wanna apply early, uh, L, typically LSAT scores matter a lot, as well as your undergraduate GPA a lot, depending on what law schools you apply to, they can, they will have, you know, if you look at, I don't know if, if Angie, your audience knows the, the 509 disclosures. Um, if there's a law school that you're interested in, my biggest advice is go to the website or just Google it, the 509 disclosures from each law school you're interested in. Download that PDF and you will see exactly their student profile, their median LSAT and GPA, their scholarships awarded to what, you know, who receives what scholarship. So all this is publicly disclosed, but students may not know, right? And so that's what I would recommend. You go ahead and download the 509 and go, okay, this is exactly their student profile and you'll know where you fit, right? And my you know, recommendation is your investment in your LSAT score and your uh, GPA is well worth it, okay? Uh, the other thing, you know, the, the, the thing I'll emphasize is the higher your LSAT score, the higher your GPA, the more likely you are to get a, a scholarship and to maximize that scholarship is your best route to make law school affordable. You know, there's this saying out there and I'll, I'll be very frank out there with, with this audience is typically, the lowest scoring individuals pay tuition for the highest scoring individuals at law school. That's just the truth, okay? So if you're in the top five, 10%, you're likely to get just about a full ride. If you're in the bottom five, 10%, you're likely to pay full price. And that full price is subsidizing the top 5% to go to law school for almost free. That's just the reality, right? So as you're preparing for to apply to law school, study, invest. It's well worth your investment to boost your LSAT scores if that's your profile to go to a highly ranked law school. Now, there are unranked law schools out there that who say, you know what? We care less about LSAT uh, scores and GPAs. We care more about your overall motivation to become an attorney and we look at the whole applicant in general, but those will be the lower ranked law schools. And those, some, there's some really good ones out there. Don't get me wrong. Okay, so you just gotta pick the ones that's right for you. And if you tend to do well in your LSAT and you have a high GPA, you have your choice. And if you don't, then you have to be very thoughtful about who you apply to. And even then apply early, because I think part of this you know, today is what are some kind of advice on applying to these different law schools and how, how to be successful is apply early, then you know, get admitted early, apply to several options. So you have a little bit of room to negotiate so you can 
believe it or not, you can negotiate your scholarships a little bit, you know, with law schools. You can kind of have that conversation. I really like you, but I have this scholarship, you know, offer from another law school. Can you match it, et cetera? There is that ability to negotiate and have open communications with the law school that you're applying to, even in these yeah. hybrid law school programs. So if you get a scholarship offer, so say you apply to full-time programs and hybrid programs and you get mm -hmm. a scholarship offer for a full-time program, do you still think that you can use that offer to negotiate for your hybrid program? Yes, yeah, absolutely. Because the, to, in the, from the law school's eyes, these programs are equivalent. They're the same faculty, same curriculum, just simply delivered in different medium and different schedule, essentially. So I've actually had students apply to residential and say, you know what, I'm, I've, I'm now, my life situation has now changed. I have to do this you know, via hybrid schedule. So can I just transfer everything over? And a law school, I can't guarantee this, but the, I've, I haven't had a situation where the law school said no, because these are essentially the same program. They've always come back and say, okay, yeah, you can transfer that scholarship over. So. You know, that's one way to do it is leverage all your tools to be very a smart shopper, a smart kind of, you know, be a student of the game, right? Download the 509 disclosures, look at what's available to you. It absolutely benefits you to apply early and apply to as many schools as it's realistic and have open communications with each law school admissions team. Call them, talk to them, ask them questions engage with them and then leverage the best offer and uh, you know, make your best decisions off of that. Awesome. So can you tell me a little bit about <clears throat> um, kind of how the difference in cost plays out? Because I know, um, you know, I've taken a bit of a glance at some law schools that offer both a part-time, you know, evening program or part-time or evening program and a hybrid program. And it seems like the costs are mostly the same. Is that pretty much true across the board or pretty much true across the board because a, a law school is fairly protective of the brand and the program right so a jd is a jd uh, from their law school same faculty same aba accredited law school so they will typically make it so that the uh, tuition is identical uh it, or you know very minute differences uh now, keep in mind, some law schools will, um, you know, depending on their audience, will maybe even charge a little bit more for the hybrid program because it does offer more flexibility. It does take um, a little bit, you know, or let's just put it that they may offer lower scholarships for a hybrid JD program just because, it, you know, you're an employed, fully employed, and this gives you the benefits of, you know, uh, doing this with more flexibility. Right. So that's where I say negotiate. Right. I mean, apply to residential programs, you know, and, and kind of um, leverage one to kind of maximize your opportunities for all the other programs. Typically, so um, are the same professors that teach the regular full time JD programs also the same ones that teach the hybrid programs or is it different? It typically is the same. So these are the same faculty members. Now, when you launch a new hybrid JD program, there may be some professors who are more technically savvy, who kind of are the innovators who say, I, I want to volunteer to teach this you know, program online. But that professor will be the same professor that teaches the on the ground residential version of that class. So no difference. But you may get, I would say, you know, let's just say you have 50 faculty at a law school, right? You may get 20 of the most tech savvy ones out of the 50 who will teach the hybrid JD program first, but eventually everybody will blend in and kind of have a teaching load. And how about the, you know, designing it so that it can still be interactive? I think one of the things that people are really scared about is that they're not gonna get the same Socratic instruction or everything that they would get in a traditional program if they're all online. You know, What have you done with um, the law schools that you work with to make sure that they develop a curriculum that is very interactive and that they will be able to learn from? 
Yeah, that's very important, right? And it will vary by school, right? Depending on if the law school is doing it themselves, if they partner with certain companies to do this, there's different standards. So I can only speak for you know the programs that we work with and we work very hard. We actually spend a lot of resources and investment in building out the law school curriculum so that it's not just a camera and you know what we call lecture capture right? where you just have a kind of a professor standing in front of a classroom and you have a camera and maybe a microphone and listening to that lecture uh, what we do is we what we we do a interactive curriculum where there is the socratic discussions and methods involved where we do record a scripted lecture where it's well thought out with pauses in the middle of the lectures where you will actually have to respond to a certain question, a concept and the applicability of that concept and then have a knowledge check online where it will actually give you feedback. Yes, no, and why is this yes and why is this no? So that, it, that you know, you wanna look for a program that does do that, that has that well thought out design and interactive learning uh, so that the lectures come to life where you actually have that engagement with law school professors so that it's both you know, synchronous and asynchronous where there's office hours, there's an ability to contact the faculty you know, with, for scheduled conversations and you know, kind of meetings after the classroom, kind of the, the lectures, et cetera. What about the quality of the experience and bonding with your peers? You know, I think a lot of people want to know if they'll still be able to talk to other students and mm -hmm. um, engage in the same extracurricular activities and, and do all of that stuff. So what um, are there any differences in hybrid programs there? Yeah, a hybrid program will typically you still have the residential sessions where you come to campus mm -hmm. and those are face to face, you know, extended hours. Uh, so what we find to, to be true is you know, our students who are in these hybrid JD programs are typically a little bit older. They are, you know, average age is probably five to 10 years older than your typical, you know, out of undergrad applicant. So they're working and they tend to bond over their professions. So they'll, they'll, they'll link and connect with their classmates who are patent agents or who are in the uh, medical industry. And, and, and so they'll, uh, but we also build in opportunities for everybody to introduce themselves, to network in the classroom, classroom, and also have, you know, oftentimes certain classes and most of our classes will have a synchronous session uh, on a weekly basis as well. So there'll be a session like this every week, right, where you kind of come together for an hour or two or three, where you get to kind of talk about what's going on with your life, meet them, see them, and, you know, interact. And then so when you do come to the campus for those kind of monthly sessions or a weekend, you know, or that four times a year, you do kind of have that networking ability and really bond with your classmates. Yeah, for the hybrid programs that you work with, are students still able to participate in the extracurricular activities like clinics and law review and moot court? Because mm -hmm. I can't imagine doing any of those online. <laughs> Yeah, they, yeah, we, we do schedule, you know, kind of those sessions in a very unique way, right? Uh, so they're, you know, and I don't know how exactly how every program is doing it, but they do. They, they do create opportunities for when they come on campus or to do them online, to have those engagements in very creative ways where it's still very much possible. Okay. Um... So what are some of the things that you would suggest to students who are trying to evaluate whether or not a hybrid program is right for them? Um, I, I think it, I would say 80% of the time to 90% of the time, it is, can I afford law school as a three-year experience full-time, right? And the answer is no, I need to be working to afford this, then you need to explore part-time and hybrid JD programs, right? Not everybody has a luxury to be able to say, I can spend, you know, a hundred, two hundred, three hundred thousand dollars in the next three years, and I've got that saved up, or I'm willing to take out financial aid and loans, or be funded by my parents and my supporters to do law school in three years. So if you if that's a no to that, 
then I would say definitely think about researching the law schools that are near you and see if they have a part-time program, evening program that allows you to be fully employed and more so a hybrid JD program design that is even more flexible with 50% of the curriculum online so that you can really put yourself through law school, right? Where you have a job uh, that is sustaining your ability to complete this in the next, you know, four years so that you can become an attorney and continue to grow your career in that way. Okay. Well, I'd like to go ahead and invite people to, um, you know, introduce themselves and, and ask your questions to you. So um, if the students, you know, who are on the call today want to just jump on camera and, um, and ask your questions, I'd love for you guys to start to participate in the conversation. So um, in the meantime, I can ask a couple more questions to you and see if we can get the discussion going. So, um, so in working with these schools, what are some challenges that you've seen that people face in, in trying to make the instruction, um, you know, of the same quality where students are really getting the most out of the experience? Yeah, what, what we're seeing is it's the initial fear of the new, the technology, you know, it, it once a faculty, we call them kind of the subject matter experts, the SMEs, right, SMEs. Uh, once they're adjusted and they've scripted things out and recorded the first few you know, weeks lectures, then they get on a roll and it becomes kind of like, oh, wow, I can be the best of myself in each of my recorded lectures, right? So, you know, if you're a law school professor and you've been teaching for, let's just say, 15 years, You've given that lecture thousands of times. <laughs> and I'm sure that not a thousand of them is your best performance or your best lecture, right? So imagine, so that's what we tell our professors. Like, if you can encapsulate the best of your past thousand lectures and capture that and have that be a representation of your work in each of your classes, wouldn't it be nice to have it done once and done really well? And then have that continuously scale throughout all your rest of your you know, next three or five or even 10 years with having to update that lecture, right? Uh, so that's what we see is just the initial fear of the unknown. And a lot of law school professors don't like to script things out, right? They like to go ad hoc and just go. But once they find that, and yeah, some professors don't script every word out, but they put bullet points and they speak naturally they're pretty engaging and they flow through it well. And once it's recorded and very successful for, for, for the first time, then it kind of rolls. And they've actually find that the feedback we've gotten from both the, the professors and the students have been phenomenal, right? Number one, the, the learning quality is just the same, if not better. Because you think about it, like if you think about online learning is there is no back row, right? When you're in an online class, the only way that you'll be successful and that you even earn a grade is to participate, is to read, to interact, to click, to answer, to participate. So there's no back row, right? In a tr traditional law school classroom, you can kind of hide out or you're in the back row and kind of maybe just, maybe you're a really good test taker, right? And you just study on your own and you're not really interacting, you're hiding out in the back row and you just rely on the final exams, the midterms, the, the assignments to kind of get your grade and then you move on, especially in kind of like your year one courses, right? Those courses are a lot of memorization and a lot of you know, kind of knowing your facts and, and your case studies and things like that. So in an online learning format, it actually can be very interactive and very rich you guys go back and review everything. You have multiple tries. You can watch lectures, pause, rewind, watch it again. Take your time and really digest that. In a traditional classroom, you can't pause the professor and rewind and rewatch and rethink. If you get, if you raise your hand, you get that question wrong. You know, it's hard to say, "Oh, can I try that again?" But in online, you can. So there's, you know, there's a reason why technology is kind of you know, really taking the lead in education that we're seeing is it actually offers many layers that make the, uh, the, the, uh, the experience even more rich. So I would say there's 
the best world is the best of both worlds where you have the best of face-to-face -face and the best of online. Yeah. Yeah, it's interesting because right now I think pretty much all law schools are online <laughs> in some way, shape, or form. Right, uh, right. It, it must well, be kind of a slap in the face for all the people who've been working so hard and, to get these hybrid programs pushed through. Well, but, but here's the thing though, Angie, Here, here's the thing you got to realize. All of the law school classes are online, but are is it is it good online, right? Because yeah. over because yeah, of COVID, right? Because of COVID, out. a lot of law school professors are just simply putting a camera, you know, putting a laptop three feet in front of them and just talking to the class, or you know, it's like, and that doesn't work unless it's well thought out and built out. There, I, that's why you get a lot of negative feedback from students and like, well, what am I paying for, right? Mm -hmm. Am I just paying for somebody on YouTube that's just kind of talking, you know? And so, you know, there's a lot of, I think, work to be done to make online meaningful engagement and just as rich, if not better than face-to-face. -face. And that's why you want to look for a program that has given that kind of investment into the program and that have built it very intentionally from the beginning to be high quality. They're not just reacting to COVID and just putting a webcam and then running the course as if it's a face-to-face -face class. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I found right now is I, I have a lot of law student mentees and folks who are currently in law school who are doing basically the Zoom school of law. And, you know, I've been encouraging all of them to, you know, you really got to take yourself out of your comfort zone and really try to connect with other people in the in your curriculum because, I mean, that's part of what law school is all about. You've got to push yourself to interact with the faculty, the other students, you know, your peers, um, because there's a lot of people who are really craving community right now. And you don't have as easy access to that if you're not on campus. So you've really got to do everything you can to reach out to people and connect with them, you know, whether it's forming a group me between the, you know, the entire class or a Slack or, or Discord or whatever it is. Um, and planning, you know, social events for you guys to actually hang out. Because I mean, let's face it, like for, for me, you know, my best connections in law school were not, or, you know, my best relationships really and friendships um, were not built in the classroom, you know, doing during a lecture. Like your best relationships are built when you guys all, you know, feel like you got hit by a bus during the midterm and you go and grab a beer afterwards. <laughs> and so you have to, you have to really make a special intention um, in these online environments to do that, to still find ways to connect with each other socially, because that's that's the really important part. Yeah, and, and I think, you know, the last thing I'll say on this is everybody's pretty new at this. So yeah. go into it knowing that you're going to help shape the experience, right? So kind of take it, take the bull by the horns and say, hey, I like to see this happen. I want to make this happen. I want to network. I want to you know, like Angie's done here is I want to create opportunities for people to have happy hours. I want to build out a community online. I want to introduce myself to the LinkedIn you know, colleagues and get connected and have follow up conversations. And next thing you know, that just becomes the norm, right? If you hadn't spoken up and didn't push your, your professor in your law school to do that, it doesn't happen because that's the way things have always been and they're not going to do it unless you ask for it. So yeah, at the beginning of the COVID pandemic, you know, I, I wasn't using zoom this way at all. I wasn't doing these meetups or anything like that. And I ended up going to another attorney's meetup. Um, and he, literally just one day, um, it was at the very beginning, you know, in March when everybody was like in full panic mode <laughs> and he was like, listen, me and like, five of my law school buddies are going to just jump on zoom and talk about all this craziness. If anybody else wants to join us, like come hang out. Right. And I was like, okay, let's go see what this is all about. And I didn't know this guy. I mean, he didn't go to my law school. He went to, you know, um, Northwestern and I went to UNH. And so I was like, you know what, it's just going to be a bunch of people just hopping on and hanging out. I'll see what this is about. Cool. And I get on and sure enough, like there were about 30 attorneys on from all over the nation. And we were just talking to each other about like what was going on in our particular geographic areas at the time with COVID and how are we changing our practices? How are we adapting right now? You know, what are the emergency, um, you know, measures that we're putting into place to make sure that we, we keep business running as usual. And it was actually really 
nice to be bonding with everybody about that. And it was just a casual conversation. And I thought, you know, I bet a lot of students need this right now. I bet a lot of them are, you know, kind of feeling lonely and they need some sort of connection. They need some sort of outlet to be able to talk to a lot of other people who are going through the same thing as them, who are thinking about going to law school or who are currently in law school. So that's why we started these. And since then, it's been awesome because, you know, people come on from all sorts of different states and, and you know, everybody is just feeling this pandemic just a little bit differently. And so hearing from everyone's perspectives has been really enriching for everyone else in the community. And that's exactly why we do these things. But I think if you're going to a school and you want to be able to implement something like this at your school so that you can really drive the conversations with your classmates, you totally can. You just have to make a special intention about it and just know that, yeah, there are other people who are doing it, but probably not in mass right now. And you could be part of, um, you know, part of this motion to like lead the way in, in creating these sorts of environments. Um, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, a couple of folks have uh, typed in some questions. I don't know if we answered them all. I think Alexandra asked, are these programs, uh, online programs accredited? And so the best way to always, you know, verify that, right, because there's a lot of law schools in, in, the, in the country, is if the law school is accredited, then all the programs are accredited, right? Their hybrid JD, their part-time evening JD program is the same as a residential. So you always want to typically ask that. Uh, and if they're, yeah, if they're an accredited law school, then all their JD programs will typically be accredited. But you can always ask. And, um, you know, it, it, the correlation is pretty high there. And yeah, I dropped uh, some lists of the part-time programs um, that are available. And also the hybrid programs are available. If you just scroll up in the chat, um, I dropped both of, some links to those lists so that you can find all of them and research them yourself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think there's one question about merit scholarship. I think we might have, you know, touched on that earlier already. But yes, right there, a law school's program, whether it's a residential, face to face, or part time or hybrid, it's the same program. So whatever scholarships you typically qualify for, you can, you know, ask for them the same way, and you should be able to transfer them back and forth. And if they say no, you should ask them why. They're, <laughs> they, they're the same program. <laughs> Does anybody else have questions for V? Oh, here we go. Um, does Walden University offer an, an online JD? I don't think Walden University is a law school. Um, I got my MBA from Walden online when I was working for Walden, I don't know, 15 years ago now. It's been a while. Uh, I don't think they're a, a, a law school. So they do, I think, offer MBAs and uh, PhDs uh, on online. Anybody else? Feel free to ask. You've got yeah, we're open for questions if you want to talk. I think I saw somebody, somebody's already in a uh, program, I think, at Syracuse, right? 3L. You know, love to kind of hear your thoughts about how that's going. And, uh, you know, are you enjoying it? Is it, is it uh, kind of fun for you? Um, yeah, I, I can provide some, some thoughts. Some Meredith, right? There. Yeah. Um, so my name is Meredith Anderson. I'm in Syracuse's JDI program. Mm -hmm. um, I work full time as a project manager in Janesville, Wisconsin. Um, Syracuse has a little different setup than I think UNH, so we only have two on campus residencies a year. Um, it's it's fascinating to kind of hear your experiences. So I'm yours are UNH, correct? Yeah, yeah, that's one of our programs. Um, have you had any play in the Syracuse JDI program? When you say play, what do you mean? I, like you said, UNH is one of your programs. Is is Syracuse's JDI? No, no, no. Uh, okay. Yeah, I don't know. I'm I'm kind of you know looking at you, Syracuse from the outside in, so I don't have any first hand experience. Uh, yeah. So, I guess my my advice to anyone looking at a hybrid program would be to do your research and and do it super thoroughly, if that makes sense. Um, talk to people who are actually in the program because. There's a difference between the opportunities will be open to all students and the opportunities actually are open to all students. So like uh, me being in the hybrid program, if I lived in Syracuse, New York, I could participate in the clinics, right? But I don't, so those aren't, those aren't available. So there's just, 
my advice would be do your research um, on, on kind of like what the caveats are to, to anything. Um, my experience has been decent. I, um, so I accelerated the program. I came in as class of 2023 um, and I'll be graduating in December of 21. Um, so I actually petitioned to take residential classes this past semester so I can kind of compare my hybrid classes with my residential classes. And I would, I would take a residential class any day over over one of our hybrid classes, but that's that's a personal, right? Like a personal opinion. What are the differences, Meredith? Um, so I travel a ton for work. I don't always, like if I'm on a plane, right? I don't have internet. Um, if I'm flying, right, I can't stream a video. Whereas if I have homework in one of my regular classes, like it's just homework, you type out your homework and you turn it in or you come to class prepared. Um, and so that's that's one of the differences. Uh, for us, there is a significant difference in course offerings uh, between residential and hybrid, right? Because the hybrid programs um, obviously have to like cater to the mass of, so our class came in at 50 people, the class behind us came in at almost 100, the class before us was 30. Um, so I got super lucky. I got, I got to jump in on 22's classes because I petitioned to take more classes. So I didn't have to wait to take classes as they came around. Um, but there's definitely a difference in the faculty, a difference in the class availability, um, a difference in even the amount of time for the classes, right? So like a three credit class in our program is an hour and a half because of the asynchronous homeworks. Um, whereas a three credit class could be an hour twice a week for a residential class, or it could just be like a two and a half hour block. Um, and so there's just, there are differences in the classes, even in um, kind of the standards the students are held to. So like JDI, because it's an online program, is held to a different standard by the Bar Association, apparently, or so we're told, right? Um, and so, for example, all of our exams have to be proctored using ProctorTrack. We used to have human proctors, and then the pandemic happened, right? Um, and so now we're we all have to use proctor track and the residential students don't like it's it's just disparities and like same program but different different kind of standards or expectations well that's fascinating it is <laughs> yeah i mean i i'm always curious because i actually so i went to unh before they had a hybrid program so i did the traditional program but i have chatted with a few unh folks um who are in the hybrid program and they they are having a pretty good experience so far it seems um, but I'd imagine that it varies significantly school to school too. I, yeah, I, so I've, I've spoken to students who are in a bunch of different hybrid programs, um, just because I considered transferring at one point in time. Um, and, um, are there any trends between all the people that you spoke to about what they think are the good elements of the hybrid program versus the bad ones? <laughs> Um, so definitely the positives are we all, most of us who are in this program work full time um, and are getting a law degree from a school that is thousands of miles away from us. <laughs> um, and I mean, law school, even if you're in person, right, law school is what you make it. So I, I've pushed an independent research project. I've taken residential classes. I've gotten to know a bunch of the faculty and like I have a trusted group of mentors and during our first residential on campus, right? I basically forced five people to be friends with me. And uh, <laughs> one of them is like my alter ego down here. She she came just to like listen to the webinar in Tennessee, um, cause she's gone to real law school before not like hybrid law school. <laughs> but my alter ego in the bottom corner there. Um, <laughs> like, yeah, I, I basically forced five people to be friends. Like, like so it's it, it's what you make of it um and that's very much the same across all the programs yeah very cool, very um, cool. well thanks it... for sharing i mean it's it's the, the good thing is the trend is going to grow i can promise you that in the coming years the, the demand for more online flexible learning hybrid programs is going to grow so more of these options will come up and i think you know, Meredith uh, gives, you know, wise advice is do your research, ask lots of questions, 
asked to talk to graduates or people who are in the program, you know, but it's good news overall, I think, because, you know, more than a few years ago, you didn't have the option to, you know, earn your JD while fully employed. And sometimes that's the only way many of us can, you know, kind of pursue that career path. Yeah. Very cool. Does anybody else have any questions for anybody? Meredith, me, V? <laughs> yeah, there's a couple of questions on, on the chat that I see, but uh, one from Eileen. What's the difference between hybrid JD and LB honors with qualifying status? I, I'm oh, not quite yeah, sure. the LLB is a- Oh, the LLB, yeah, okay. <laughs> So, um, so in, in the United States, you can't get an LLB. Um, yeah. That's the difference. <laughs> um, so in the United States, you know, we have the Juris Doctor degree and you have to go and get a bachelor's degree, a four-year bachelor's degree before you can get a JD degree. Um, and for foreign students that are on this call, oh, I completely forgot that this. Yeah. <laughs> um, so Good for question. foreign students who are on this call, um, there is a Bachelor of Laws degree that many countries do offer. And it's typically a five-year degree straight out of high school. And it's like, a, it's an equivalent of a bachelor's degree. In the US, we have this wonky system where you have to go get a bachelor's degree first then you can do your JD degree um so that's the differences um yeah. and then let's see my fiance is in the military and um if he's able to convince me to move with him it'll be in the middle of one another. is it better is it possible to transfer from one school to another um school's part-time program Ooh, yes but really <laughs> difficult um because you know the curriculums are going to be a little bit different and um the requirements are going to be different but v i'd love to get your thoughts on yeah, this I, I so basically you probably have the same shot of transferring if you were in a residential jd program right and typically law schools don't like you transferring from one because that's the brand like for example like you know if you went to a let's just say 75 you know, percentile ranked law school, right? You know, and if you could transfer seamlessly to a top five law school, right? Everybody would do it, right? Everybody would go to one law school, you know, uh, and then take the very last class at a Harvard or Stanford or something like that, right? That's why law schools are still a traditional, I would say, it, it's kind of a very traditional business and tr traditional culture. So they will tend to want you to, you know, in register with them, do the whole program with them. Now, will they make exceptions? Yes, right? It depends how attractive a candidate you are and what's your rationale. If you come from, you know, if your credits are from a really great law school and you had a legitimate reason why you're wanting to transfer this law school because of a certain class or, you moved or some, something in life happened where you're no longer able to complete it at that law school, but it's all, you're in great standing, then it's all about your ability to negotiate, right? Law schools want great students with great backgrounds, test scores and everything, right? So make your case. Uh, and if, as long as your profile is strong, I would say it never hurts to ask and to make your best argument as an attorney would and see if it, it works. But in general, they don't encourage it and it's, it's not as easy as you think. Do you think that the admissions um, cycles are more competitive for traditional programs than hybrid or is it the same? Hmm, let me, let me give that some thought. I would say it's about the same. Um, I would say it, 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 it's about the same. Yeah, a, a very little difference because, and that's because the same director of admissions who's admitting students to the residential is also admitting students to the online hybrid programs, right? So their medians blend in. So, you know, you know, law schools operate by rankings and the rankings are pretty much 50% LSAT score, 50% UGPA, which is undergraduate GPA. And I would even say they put probably 70 75% weight on the LSAT scores and 25%, you know, that's just my personal, you know, kind of perspective on that. It's a little bit higher on the LSAT score. So the same director is admitting students, you know, based on a school's median, right? And so when they admit somebody above the median, they'll admit somebody below the median to balance it out, so on and so forth. They play the, this, this whole complex algorithm almost that each law school does to continue to maintain their medians and to hopefully 
go up the medians. So the this is still absolutely true that the best thing you can do is to score well in the LSAT or the GRE. Now, uh, some hybrid programs are starting to recognize that these are working professionals and some may actually prefer the GRE. And so don't just limit yourself to LSAT, right? If you're better at GRE and if you happen to be near a law school that accepts a GRE, I would pursue that because some students actually do much better in the GRE. And so if a law school offers GRE option, definitely explore that. But I would say it's typically the same admission criteria and standards for hybrid versus you know, residential. And your best shot is to apply early and to do really well uh, in your LSAT and have a strong GPA coming in. Yeah, I mean, I, I typically advise our students, you know, if you're thinking about going to law school, you should shoot for taking one of the summer LSATs so that you can, you know, make okay. sure that you don't get the score that you want. Yeah. <laughs> you can still do a retake before the application cycle starts because it starts a lot earlier than people think, you know, I mean, the applications open in August or September. A lot of people have their applications in by December. And, you know, even though they say the application deadlines in March, you know, pretty much everybody's admitted, you know, by January. So it's, it's a play, lot. Um, play the LSAT game. It's well worth your investment. I mean, a law school is hundreds, th hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, uh, LSAT prep, uh, like the Khan Academy offers free LSAT prep, you know, content and materials. Uh, do all the free ones. Invest in yourself in that way. Even if you pay for a $700 yeah. LSAT course, that do could it. be the difference of thousands of dollars in scholarships. In scholarships. You know, just, just a few points mm -hmm. could be the difference in a lot of scholarships. Yeah. And, and, and set kind of, if, if I were you all and think about law school, I would do this, right? Download every law school's 509, look at the medians, take an initial LSAT and see where you fall and do a little grid where this is, you know, kind of the, 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 the schools that fall in within your kind of, um, kind of your scale of where you're at in GPA and LSAT and definitely apply to schools that, you know, where you're right at the middle, apply for schools where you're lower and apply for schools where you're higher and leverage all three to maximize your scholarship, right? Because, and if you're flexible, you have that option uh, because that's probably the best use of your time is to kind of be very thorough and do your research and know where, how each law school sees you because uh, one law school is to see you as average, whereas another law school is go, oh, if we can get somebody with that LSAT and that GPA, we're really happy to give a 50% or 75% scholarship to. Whereas another law school goes, well, think about admitting you, but you're going to pay full price. It's a big difference. Yeah. The ABA 509 reports, by the way, are required disclosures for every um, ABA accredited law school. So um, every law school has to put into a report, you know, what their LSAT scores are, and the medians and 25th percentile and 75th percentile for their LSAT GPA um, for people who are admitted, as well as um, employment numbers, you know, how many people get employed every year from graduating classes, they have to put in bar percentage, bar passage percentages. So really dig into those ABA 509 reports and figure out like, is this really the quality of school that you want to be attending? You know, if the school um, is about your same, you know, LSAT and GPA, great, they might admit you, but then if you go and look at their bar passage rates and it's, you know, 40%, <laughs> um, you know, that's, that's not so good. And then if their employment ratings are, you know, 20%, that's even, that's even worse. So you might not want to go to any law school that you can possibly yeah. get admitted to if they're not giving you the quality of education that's going to help you actually get a job. Yeah. And, and I'll say one more thing about bar passage. So there's a lot of debate out there, right? But typical law school curriculum does not necessarily prepare you to pass the bar. <laughs> okay. So that's why, you know, I, I work for Barbary. So full disclosure, you should, do, you should look at, you know, as you're researching a school, you'd be surprised at how the correlation is not necessarily that strong that, um, you know, attending a certain school will either in, help you or not help you pass the bar. It's sometimes is your effort is how you, well you study for the bar and how well you prep for the bar exam is mm -hmm. more than anything else. It might be a correlation, but it may not be a result of a, law school's curriculum that helps you pass the bar, right? Because if you're, 
you know, the top 1% of law school students out there. You're just of the personality that no matter which law school you go to, you're going to study hard and you're going to pass the bar, right? Because that's the kind of, you know, the, the engine that's inside you that's going to drive that. So think about that too. And, you know, do your research about what's going to help you pass the bar. And is it really the school's curriculum or is it your ability to pass the bar? Yeah. All righty. Well, thank you so much. I know we're at the top of the hour. I really appreciate you spending your time with us, V, and explaining all these great things about these programs to these students. You know, I didn't realize these were options um, because when I went to law school, many of them weren't available. So this is an you know, awesome possibility now for people who are interested in continuing to work and be able to get their law degrees. So thank you so much for your time. And, and thank you, Meredith, for sharing all of your experiences. Yeah, thanks, well. Meredith. That's been great conversation, Angie. Appreciate, uh, you know, you inviting me on board and happy to do it. Awesome. And we have a, our virtual happy hours at 4 p.m. Central this afternoon. So if you want to actually come and network with people, we're going to split everybody into breakout rooms. You're actually going get, to get to chat with people one-on-one. Um, -on -one. So yeah, come hang out with us at 4. Right. Bye, everybody. Thanks.